Oh my god, my hair looks like a mess in the heat. Hey everyone, so this is going to be a bit of a pre-intro to the intro because I need to do sort of like a little mini channel update, but there are timestamps down below if you want to skip it, I understand, if you're not interested in the mini channel update, but I do want to just say that thanks to a slight misunderstanding, I may not have a Twitter account anymore. Now, that's, uh, that's, that's, you know, that's fine. Uh, but I am very much in my post Twitter era. So I'm going to say, if you do want to keep up with me outside of YouTube, uh, there is a link tree down below and there will also be a link to my discord. So yeah, just go find me on other stuff. Not all of it is content. Some of it is just me posting food pictures and stuff like that, but you know, you might like it. Also, I have recently come into some very good news, and this news does not affect, does not affect the channel in any way. If anything, it means that I can probably get a bit more weird and wild with it. So look forward to that. And I guess that's kind of all I had to say for the little pre-intro. So I'm going to hand you off to me, who's going to be very serious and you know, sensible about it. But uh, yeah. Just uh, do find me on all of the other stuff. Twitch, uh, I have podcast, I have the Discord. Just go find me in places. You know, I'm everywhere. Except Twitter now, where I am uh, very much not. Just, you know, take my advice. Don't ever support your local sports team. It is it is only going to result in problems. But anyway, I'll give you... Hand you to me being serious. All right, the mighty patrons have commanded me to do a video about the most annoying thing I could think of, and yet again, I have done it to myself, because I saw the thumbnail for this video, which kept being recommended to me, and decided, huh, yeah, NATO expansion doesn't necessarily factor into the war in Ukraine in the way that some people would like to believe. But also, is it an unmitigated good? Uh, also, I just think Bill Clinton, terrible melt that he is, looks kind of cool in the thumbnail, you know? I should be upfront and say that my late night YouTube viewings these days are more confined to speak with animals compilations in Baldur's Gate 3 and people playing one province countries in Paradox games, so I did not watch this video. This is not a critique of the video, we're not doing beef. This video is not a response to anything in that video, it's just something that prompted me to foolishly consider the topic as one worth considering. The thing about this topic is that to be direct about it, no one can be normal about anything to do with NATO. No matter what you say about it, you're annoying someone. So I am going to take the high road here and just say that you are probably going to be annoyed by things I say at some point in this video. But in order to soften the blow a little bit, I'm gonna address the most common and likely lines of criticism and disagreement I'm probably going to get in the current context for the positions I take in this video. Look, I get it. Pre-addressing comments that you're going to get is a loser's game. But I'm going to do it anyway. I just feel better doing it. Uh, if you don't want the disclaimers, you can just skip to the timestamp on the screen and the video will just happen. It will, it will, it will magically continue. First objection. Why make this video now in the context of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, especially when you've not made a video explicitly critical of Russia? Are you some kind of Russia slash Putin slash Z shill? I'll take this in order. Why make the video now? Well, be mostly because the patrons voted for it. And if you want to tell me what I should be making videos about uh, and not have me be able to ignore it, the Patreon is where you need to go. But there's a more serious part of the question. There will never be a good time to bring up these questions. If you come at them from the perspective of a NATO supporter, there's an implication that if you're critical of one thing, you must support another. And that's not true. Here's a hard truth. More than one thing can be bad for different reasons and to different degrees. If you're unable to accept that, then this video really isn't for you. Thanks for making it this far. I know it must have been hard, but you know, if you'd like to like and subscribe on the way out, that'd be great, but I'm not being, I think I might be being a bit optimistic there. I've also not made a video explicitly critical of Russia, and while I've thrown in the occasional barb, some might find it odd that I'm doing a whole video about NATO, and not one about Russia. First of all, to bring it back to the video that prompted the topic, if we take the position that NATO expansion 
had nothing to do with, or at least wasn't the largest causal factor in their invasion of Ukraine, then approaching this topic shouldn't mean I have to address Russia at all. Now, we don't live in a world where people can go from A to B without some wild detours, so I do have to get out ahead of it. The fact is, I don't live in Russia. Uh, this bedroom is not located in St. Petersburg. It's located in Nottingham in the UK in a founding NATO state. I have a much better place to critique that group of things than Russia. Plus, if you want content critical of Russia, or indeed any country that's considered hostile to the US, you can find that very easily. It would not be adding anything to the conversation if I did a video that was like the horrors of Putin or whatever it is that you want me to make. I have limited time and if we're being honest with each other, limited abilities and interests. NATO interests me from my perspectives and experiences, Russia doesn't. Russia never backed a military regime that put members of my family in prison, for example. So maybe a reasoning behind being more interested in one than the other. This is all easy for you to say. You live on an island and you don't have to live with a border with Russia. That's true. I do live in Great Britain and that does mean the country I live in has only one land border which is with Ireland. Now that land border probably shouldn't exist and I do find it funny that there are people in Ireland who advocate for abandoning neutrality and joining NATO when there's a hostile colonial occupation of part of their country by a NATO member, but that's for the Irish to figure out. This video is not advocating for non-alignment or neutrality. This video is not making a judgment on you, I promise. For example, if you live in Lithuania and feel you need to be in NATO, then you have made judgments based on your particular context. I can only exercise my judgment based on my particular context. This video is about people who defend NATO and what they are actually defending. And whether the claims of some that NATO can be changed into a broader force for good, using the loosest possible definition of that, is even plausible. But what about the Soviet Union? Did you know they did bad things during the Cold War too? Yes. Like, obviously I know that, but I don't live in the former Soviet Union. I have no personal connection to the former Soviet Union aside from my partner being from Lithuania. If I were to present a commentary on the Soviet Union or Warsaw Pact's conduct in the Cold War, it would be pretty bare bones and uninteresting. Again, if you want these criticisms, they are widely available. Admittedly, a lot of them have questionable factual bases, but they do exist. This video is not a comparative analysis. I am not trying to lead you to a conclusion that one is worse than the other for a comparison. The point of this video is, and I'll say it as many times as I need to say it, to provide an understanding of what you would be defending if you defend or support NATO, and whether those arguments are sound or not. Some more comments that we're likely to get will go along this sort of line. LOL, your sources are dumb and partisan. You never set out to be honest about NATO. You're just anti-West. To this, I can only say that whatever sources I do use, they'll be in the description. Uh, I'll draw from as wide a variety of sources as possible, including NATO itself. And it's like its website is now my new favorite thing. But, you know, just bear with me before I like really go into and go into it and make this a love letter to NATO's website. And look, if you still think I'm not being honest in my assessments or that I'm just like crudely anti-West, then I don't think I'm going to change your mind. I don't want to engage in that kind of pro versus anti-West thought though, but you can watch my content and draw your own conclusions about where I sit on that argument. With those out of the way, I think we can finally get into the video itself. So for the first time on this channel, I think we're actually going to begin the story at the beginning, which is... Strange. I'm not sure I'm ever going to get used to it, but let's 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 just try. It. Let's try it. Let's go back in time. Uh, the year is 1945, and the Allies have just defeated the Axis powers. The Germans knew their time was up with the fall of Berlin, and the Japanese, as the last man standing, unconditionally surrendered to the U.S. after a combination of the U.S. victory at the Battle of Saipan and the Mariana and Palau Island campaigns left their home islands open to invasion. The defeat of the Kwantung army in Manchuria by the Soviets uh, definitely contributed to it, and I suppose the Oppenheimer thing may have had something to do with it, but I would contend the bigger factor was fear of surrender to Stalin, which 
and I say it out loud, sounds like a weird game that you would see on the Steam uh, store. The Allies basking in their victory over fascism would surely be friends for eternity, like in those old British path clips of Stalin, FDR, and Churchill together, right? Well, eternity is a surprisingly short period of time, and alliances of convenience have a funny thing where once they stop being convenient, they start to fall apart. Now, this didn't happen all at once, they didn't do their various victory parades and then go, your economic system is a virus of Satan, and then throw up walls. Speaking of economic systems, and I promise you this tangent is going to make sense, it's important for us to understand the state of Europe after World War II. This picture looks like it could be from Hiroshima or Nagasaki, if not for the surviving bits of architecture marking it out as European. This picture is of post-war Warsaw. The Nazis put in a lot of effort to destroy the city on the way out, and well, this was the result. There was also Allied strategic bombing that led to things like this picture of Nuremberg and this picture of Köln. Uh, yeah, look, they're pretty brutal. Where am I going with this? Well, first of all, I want to emphasize the situation Europe was in at the time. And yes, I know the devastation extended beyond Europe, but for now, let's just sort of narrow in. Just a tiny bit, right? To describe it as a post-apocalyptic wasteland wouldn't do it justice. I mean, they still had some recognizable pre-war buildings in Fallout. I mean, more than one, at least. With this level of devastation comes, and this sounds cold, but it is true, opportunities, especially if you're one of the two emerging superpowers in a post-war world who have opposing surface level commitments to specific ways to organize the world, the economy and society at large. If you could successfully rebuild these countries using your preferred system and you could do it in a better way than the other side, well then your system would obviously be superior. Never mind the externalities or the balances of power or whatever, but your system would clearly be better, right? That leads to some competing pressures. On the one hand, you and the other superpower agreed to elections in what you call liberated Europe. And there's a funny thing about elections, is that they're a bit unpredictable. And a lot of forces had gained credibility throughout the war. Take, for example, the communists who, through partisan resistance against fascism and involvement in anti-occupation resistance movements, had gained a lot of popularity in places like Italy and France, to the extent that the first post-war French election resulted in a parliament where the communists were the largest party. The thing is that communism and communist parties were generally seen to be taking the orders of the big man himself, Stalin, and the Bolshevik party, or at least the ideological alignment was uncomfortable for largely capitalist states in the West. The Soviet Union, for its part, pretty much decided that in the areas that it liberated that communist government should be installed, and this made people uh, a tiny bit anxious. Installing a government is predictable, but maybe a little tiny bit threatening when you have the army that just ground the Wehrmacht into a fine paste in territories across Eastern Europe, and you have British and American troops all across Europe too. Things might get out of hand if you take things too far, and whether or not the Soviets could have defeated the remainder of the Allies in a conventional war, the wave of destruction it would have caused was clearly enough for tensions to be deferred to a Cold War rather than an Operation Unthinkable, which perhaps tells you what the contemporary people thought of that idea at the time. I know it's common for the British among us to think of anti-communism as the driving ideological force in America, but in Britain, while the country is decidedly anti-communist, it didn't reach the level of hysteria that America did. And that's not really true. I mean, there wasn't like a seriously publicly conducted shit show on the scale of McCarthyism, but the British state really put its shoulder to the wheel based on that same hysteria. If you wanted like a pre-war example, uh, you could take the forged Zinoviev letter, which was sensationalized by, in a shocking twist, the Daily Mail, uh, with lurid promises of a Bolshevik-style revolution in Britain. Man, they loved threatening us with a good time. 
but I do wonder if we've heard or seen something like that recently. Anyway, the letter probably contributed quite significantly to the defeat of the Labour Party in 1924, and my question to you is this. Do you think that this ridiculous overreaction to a forgery was just sort of like an accident, right? It just, just so sort of happened to play out like this, or do we think it could be part of a larger pattern? In fact, we begin to see some of this manifest in some of the predecessor alliances and treaties to NATO. Uh, the British and French renewed their alliance, which was aimed at deterring a future German or Soviet invasion, and to be fair, the alliance kind of worked out quite well for them, generally speaking, not so much for the French a lot of the time. And later it was expanded with the Treaty of Brussels to add the Benelux countries to them with a mutual defence pact with them. So there is an Article 4 of the Brussels Pact that states, If any of the high contracting parties should be the object of an armed attack in Europe, the other high contracting parties will, in accordance with the provisions of Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations, afford the party so attacked all the military and other aid and assistance in their power. Those of you who know about Article 5 as it relates to NATO will find the spirit of that text very familiar, for good reason. The Brussels Pact was the foundation on which the European part of NATO was really built. The motivation, however the powers involved may have justified it, was anti-communism. France had at the time the most electorally successful communist party in Western Europe. Integration into an anti-communist military alliance has its uses for you in that specific circumstance if you're a capitalist state. Now you might hear me say that and say, well of course it has its uses. The primary enemy they perceived at the time was the Soviet Union and its satellite states. Of course mutual defense against them is useful. What are you, stupid? Well I'm certainly stupid enough to be recording this during rush hour because I bet you heard that really loud fucking motorcycle go by. First of all, ouch. No need to be so hurtful, but secondly, you do have a point. I do need to be more specific about the utility of NATO and the predecessor Brussels Pact or Western Union. So let me introduce you to one way it provided some anti-communist utility. First, I need to explain what our starting point is. So we need to think back to 1945 and the immediate post-war years. I don't know if any of you are watching Ahsoka, the new Star Wars thing, but if you are, you might recall the line, an empire doesn't become a republic overnight, in reference to former Imperials being involved in the new republics. Like, everything, basically. Well, think about most of the countries that formed the Brussels Pact. What did they have in common? Think about it for a second. France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. They were all in various forms and by various administrative arrangements occupied by Nazi Germany, and they all had collaborators. Whether it was Pétain and the various French collaborationist political parties which eagerly cooperated with the Germans and the Gestapo, uh, the National Socialist Movement in the Netherlands, who were the only legal party in the Netherlands under German occupation, even the Luxembourgish had a collaborationist movement of their own who tried to run a referendum on voluntarily joining Germany and completely fucked it up. Which, yeah, I mean, when you think about the general competence of some of these people, yeah, it was kind of the obvious outcome. The point is that while we all like to imagine that we'd be partisans and resistance members and maybe we would be, a lot of people would have collaborated, and while people like illegitimate Vichy Prime Minister Pierre Laval got executed by firing squad, there were a lot of people who weren't, and a lot of them were reintegrated into their societies, and in the context of the Cold War, a lot of these people were useful. 400,000 people who were declared Nazi criminals in Germany were given amnesty and denazification as much as people kind of, you know, herald it and vaunt it, it really wasn't followed through completely because of how important West Germany would be in the Cold War. This will be relevant a bit later, but if you want something that I think falls under common knowledge, German physicists working at NASA are the classic example. You know the Saturn V rocket? The one that took the American astronauts to the moon? Uh, the person credited with being the architect of that was a man named Werner von Braun. His other famous accomplishment, the V2 rocket, which did this to London. 
There's a point to this that'll be relevant in a little bit, but when anti-communism becomes one of your core political motivators, you'll be amazed at the kinds of things that you excuse or even endorse. Like, look, I get it. The Allies had an alliance of convenience with each other. But at a certain point, once that convenience ends, another might begin. First, I need to get to my actual damn point, though, which is that NATO was eventually founded on the 4th of April 1949, and I thank God every day that it wasn't a day before that, because otherwise I'd be sharing my birthday with NATO and Nigel Farage, the posh frog impersonator. And that just would have been too much of a cross to bear for me, I think. If you want a mission statement as to why NATO exists, well, NATO has a website that I don't think many people go on very often because it can be a bit by crimes.txt. They, to their credit, I guess, don't really hide what they're about. They state about their founding that the North Atlantic Alliance was founded in the aftermath of the Second World War. Its purpose was to secure peace in Europe and to promote cooperation among its members and to guard their freedom. All of this in the context of countering the threat posed at the time by the Soviet Union, which corroborates a lot of what we've already talked about. It was about the Soviet Union and at the time, and to be honest now, it's a little bit difficult to divorce the Soviet Union from communism. It also sets out some of the basic principles for its members, which, look, they're going to be relevant for the rest of this video, so just pay attention here. It commits the allies to democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law, as well as the peaceful resolution of disputes. That's a pretty broad set of values that can be interpreted in a lot of ways, but I would say it corresponds with the boilerplate beige commitments of your average liberal democracy. Or at least what most people imagine when they think of liberal democracies. There's nothing inherently wrong with those as statements of intent or values, but this got me thinking. Who were the NATO founders and did they have something in common with each other? Let's look at a list of them, right? Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, the UK, and the US. And no, I didn't remember those off the top of my head, I have a script. Uh, if you think about these countries today, you would just think that these are, you know, they're just you know, approximately aligned on a lot of things, including supporting the US. I mean, one of them is the US, but, you know, so obviously they would support themselves. I don't know, not necessarily obvious given the way it behaves, but still, you might look at those countries and shrug. What's special about it, right? First of all, let's go back again. I know we're sick of going back to the future constantly, to 1949. And let me ask you a question. How many of these countries border a future Warsaw Pact country? Because the Warsaw Pact was founded in 1940, 1955. 1945, that would have been a bit quick. 1955. The answer is one, and I won't lie, it is one that I regularly forget about. Norway, whose border is in the Arctic Circle with what's now Russia and was the Soviet Union. So why do they feel threatened by something most of them don't border? I mean, we know that the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact never engaged in a direct conventional war in Europe because I'm here talking about it, and I'm not, like, vaporized radioactive carbon. If people chalk the fact that I'm not radioactive carbon to NATO, but I, may I present you this clip from little-known TV show The Simpsons? Ah, not a bear in sight. The bear patrol must be working like a charm. I just wanted to get that clip in. I looked at this list and at the stated values, and well, let's just say some of these countries had something special in common. Running through them in no particular order, tell me you, viewer, tell me what Belgium, France, the Netherlands, Portugal, and the UK had in common at that time. I mean, if you want to go further back into history and into kind of niche shit, uh, you could throw in Denmark and Norway too, but it's that they had colonial empires. I mean, you could argue that the US and Canada are also colonial empires, they're certainly settler colonies, and Italy had Libya and Ethiopia. My point is, that if we return to NATO's stated values, democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law, 
those things were pretty notoriously in short supply in the colonial part of colonial empires. Hell, even some of these countries today, it is in pretty short supply. But to push the example of where an ideological commitment to anti-communism gets you, it gets you to the point that you can claim that 1949 Portugal was compatible with those ideals. A country that at the time was dominated by Salazar, whose regime, the Estado Novo, was a fascist regime welcomed with open arms into NATO. I will talk a bit more about flexibility and alliances and convenience and how far it goes, but that is a pretty strong opener, and it doesn't really augur especially well for where it's all going. With the origin story, and a little bit extra, sorry about that, out of the way, we now have an organization committed to opposing the Soviet Union and communism, that accepts fascists into its ranks at the governmental level, and whose membership will expand over the years of the Cold War. So in the Cold War, there were three rounds of expansion. In 1952, Turkey and Greece joined. In 1955, after its status as an occupied country came to an end, West Germany joined, and in 1982, Spain joined, having recently been a fascist dictatorship under Franco and then having gone through an attempted military coup the year before. So, you know, you might already have a sense of how I feel about this question, but I want to frame it. Even before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, there were people who publicly liked to declare themselves as leftists and on the left who, let's be honest with each other, were mostly people identifying as social democrats coping with the fact that the reality of their politics is right-wing, who felt that NATO membership was simply unquestionable. But also that if you were to question it, they had a few common lines they would retreat to. Do these lines match the reality of the organization, and what does it mean for supporters if they don't? I mean, look, if they were being honest and candid about what they believed, which a lot of them aren't, but let's make up a NATO supporter to actually have a conversation with, I find the idea that to question membership in the Alliance is completely out of bounds to not just be incompatible with the Alliance's own stated values, and as we'll see, some of the defenses supporters wheel out, but a little tiny bit sinister. To take some examples, Pew Research looked at the favorability of the Alliance in member states in 2019, and while, yes, the Alliance is generally seen favorably across its constituent members' public, there are some interesting exceptions. For example, majorities in Turkey and Greece had a negative opinion of NATO, and mm, might we wonder why that's the case? And over 30% of the public in Germany, Slovakia, France, and Spain had a negative opinion. Even in the UK, it's 23%. And are those 23% represented by any political party? And if they were, do we think that this would be met in the spirit of democratic pluralism? Or would there be a series of meltdowns from the worst dickheads in the country? Hard to say. Except I already did a video about that. You should go check it out. We'll get to these views and whether they can really be represented in NATO countries shortly. Let's actually start to look at some of the common claims made about NATO. These are largely anecdotal ones that I've encountered. It's not meant to be exhaustive or comprehensive, but when I've seen the topic discussed, here's where people tend to go and what I think the thought processes behind them are because I am nothing if not the fairest person ever in history. Firstly, I see the idea that no one is forcing countries to join NATO, or at least that NATO isn't forcing countries to join it. Circumstances might feel, make people feel like they're compelled to join. That it's a voluntary, inflexible association. For example, Iceland has no standing army, uh, and France was able to disentangle itself from NATO's integrated military command. It has an established process for withdrawal, and if anyone wants to, they can just leave. This one's pretty simple to understand, so I don't think we need to expand much more on it right now, but you might sense a little bit of skepticism as I mull it over and say it out loud. We'll get to the substance of these claims in a bit, like I said, but just know that if my tone is flat while I'm talking about them, just imagine I'm being a sarcastic bitch about every single one of these. Another common line is that it's a defensive alliance, that it acts to defend the interests of alliance members and at most, the maximum aggression it does is peacekeeping, which shouldn't really be the job of a military alliance made up of, let's be honest, strongly politically aligned countries whose members are entirely in the global north. But let's take it as it's presented to us 
for now. The relevant article of the North Atlantic Treaty is the infamous Article 5. Uh, again, I'll link to my new favorite website, the NATO website, so you can see the full text of it, but it's summarized by them in this way. Article 5 provides that if a NATO ally is the victim of an armed attack, each and every other member of the alliance will consider this an act of violence as an armed attack against all members and will take the actions it deems necessary to assist the ally attacked. Which certainly seems like it's defensive in mind. But, you know, if we lived in the Paradox Games fantasy land where defensive packs are just defensive packs with no other implications, yeah, you know, um, it's an alliance whose treaty stipulates mutual defense and doesn't say we must engage in a first doctrine strike against country X or alliance Y. I can see why people would believe this. The next point you often run into is that NATO is an alliance of democracies and elegantly stepping over the sort of Salazar point in the room, at, at its founding in the troubled early transition to democracy Spain, if you didn't really know very much about the history of each NATO country, you might well say this is somewhat uncontroversial. We might quibble about how meaningfully democratic these countries are or what constitutes meaningful democracy, but on the surface level, yeah, I kind of get why people just roll with this. And the other broad point is that NATO has generally made the world safer. And again, if you take the Paradox Games model of defensive alliances, I can understand it, right? I've recently been playing EU4 on stream, and the larger the coalition against you, the more you weigh up the risk of doing huge and devastating offensive wars. Do these hold up? Well, let's just go for them and deliver some verdicts. The first point is that it's a voluntary association. No one forces anyone to join, or at least NATO itself doesn't force anyone to join. And there are mechanisms to leave. The arrangement is flexible, so on and so on. On the surface, this one is pretty much true. No country has been forced by NATO occupation to join the organization. In fact, when France withdrew from NATO's integrated military command, but crucially and interestingly remained a, a member, um, and they asked for non-French NATO troops to leave, they left. Now, any speculation from there would be counterfactual, right? Like, what if Britain wanted to leave NATO? Which is an interesting concept, but my gut instinct shooting from the hip opinion on that is not interesting or helpful right now. But if you wanted it, leaving would probably be hampered by a number of things depending on the specific context and country. I've already hinted at what I think that would look like in the UK with a media crusade against anyone who even suggested at skepticism towards NATO. But there will be some relevant information about what NATO is willing to tolerate in just a little bit that will give you a bit more of a clue as to what I think would definitely happen in some cases. Generally though, I'm gonna say that no one has been compelled by military force from NATO alone to join NATO. There's some question marks around West Germany, given a lot of anxieties around Germany before they joined in 1955, and given the recent history there at the time, I kind of sympathise with the anxieties. But that was political pressure, and just because there were political pressures, that doesn't mean that the West German government was forced into it. Just ignore the stuff about the preceding years and it being occupied, you know? The second point is that NATO is a defensive alliance, and I definitely rolled my eyes as I said that. Look, can you hold an entire alliance responsible for the actions of its members? That basically determines how you feel about this particular argument. Because yes, Article 5 does frame the alliance itself as a defensive arrangement, but even if we discount the actions of constituent members, which I don't think we should, but let's just sort of do it for the force experiment then we're left with a particular recent example where the alliance did not act defensively. NATO's bombing campaign in Libya was not a response to a direct threat from Gaddafi, unless they thought that his frankly enlightened thinking on the issue of Switzerland was a military threat to any of their members. While NATO insisted it only used precision weapons and tried to use the utmost care, which... Gee, I, won I wonder where else we hear this kind of language, by the way. They dropped over 7,000 bombs, and there were a lot of civilian casualties. Like, even the New York Times found the capacity to criticize NATO's actions. To say nothing of the aftermath of what happened in Libya, which was nothing short of a catastrophe. Look, none of this is to say that Gaddafi was good, because I think that Gaddafi's regime would merit a video of its own. But his regime was absolutely not going to lead an armed attack on a member state at that point. And while human trafficking was absolutely facilitated through Libya, 
prior to Gaddafi's overthrow, aided by NATO, Libya underwent a boom after he went. Not the kind where bombs fall, or the kind that you really want. Instead, it had a booming slave market. It's great. I'll, I'll drop a link to an article on slavery in Libya down below. Just fair warning, it's pretty grim. Next, we come to the issue of whether it's a coalition of democracies. I've already mentioned Salazar, and to be honest, there are so many directions we could go for this. We could talk about the continued membership of Greece under the regime of the colonels, Turkey, who for a while were going through a military coup a decade, uh, Operation Gladio, the stay-behind anti-communist paramilitary, which was involved in violence and had members who were former Nazis and fascists, and it had terrorism go on, and plausible involvement in events leading to certain military coups, and also anti-communist death squads. The US to this day maintains it was just a stay-behind operation, but that's simply not true. That may have been the intent, and I would suggest we have reasons to doubt that that was the case, because if that was the intent, why are you hiring these people? But it certainly wasn't the outcome. Instead of diving into all that, I'll just provide two points, one contemporary, one historical. The contemporary one is to look back at those values NATO claims its members uphold. You know what I'm going to say, but it's worth saying. Do NATO members wholly embody those values? Uh, and if they don't, should we take the claims that they uphold them seriously? Uh, take Hungary, for example, commonly regarded as a country that under Orban has slid into conservative authoritarianism to the point that the European Parliament said it can no longer be considered a full democracy. Or we could take the example of Turkey under Erdogan, which is a little personal, so I won't be able to do the whole cool detached thing about it. But even a broad opposition alliance failed to oust them from office amidst an economic crisis and a bungled emergency response to an earthquake. Arguably, the worst parts of those earthquakes were caused by his party's policies during Turkey's construction booms. Turkey is also a country where Kurdish people have been subjected to Turkification historically, or as we might call it, cultural genocide, and they still don't enjoy proper rights in Turkey today. America, which retains dominance in the alliance, is just littered with these exact issues, right? Whether it's abortion rights being restricted, police brutality, disproportionate imprisonment of black people, having the largest incarcerated population in the world at various times, which is generally always near the top of that statistic, gerrymandered electorates, voter suppression, a system for electing a president where the loser can win, a Supreme Court stacked with a collection of weird right-wing freaks who just side with corporations or social conservatives every chance they get, and of course policies that amount to eradication of LGBTQ plus people, particularly trans people. Does that sound like a shining beacon of democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law, or does it in fact sound like a lot of the things that NATO supporters would say about a country they're about to bomb into oblivion? There is no mechanism in the North Atlantic Treaty to expel a member state, but wouldn't you think if the stated values were more than a Trojan horse to trick gullible or willfully stupid people into supporting them, that they'd find a mechanism? This argument can also be made about the EU, but that's also probably another video to be made one day. The contemporary aspect of tolerating this is part of a long tradition in NATO, and really part of what I'd call now anti-communism without communists or communism. Well, okay, there's maybe like a little bit of communism, but let's be honest. China is probably the most important country with a communist party in power. And while a lot of people are driving towards a renewed sort of Cold War with China taking the place of uh, the Soviet Union, China is dubiously communist, if you were asking me. And pursuing a Cold War against a country that is basically integrated into every supply chain in the world is not the 60 chess move that some people think of it, it is. It's just not. See, it's so dumb I was fumbling over my words. The historical example is simply toleration of Nazis throughout the history of NATO. In fact, in 2022, NATO appointed a neo-Nazi to chief of intelligence, which is, you know, I think completely fine and great, you know. But the example I want to cite is the example of Adolf Huysinger, who can be seen here hanging out with a certain person in part of his role as a general in the Wehrmacht. Which, you know, cool. Very cool. This is an aside, but my partner's a big World War II buff. I pointed because she's just through that wall there. 
Uh, she's a big World War II buff. She reads way too many books about it for my taste, but when I was telling her about this, she insisted that the Wehrmacht was politically neutral. Which, no. Look, the, the army in a lot of countries is seen as non-political, but it's probably more accurate to say non-partisan. Like, in America, the army will accept the order of a Republican or Democratic president, or at least you kind of hope so. That's actually maybe not a great example, but the doubt that, that saying that created in me perhaps indicates that militaries aren't quite as neutral as we might like to believe. Even if you accept that senior military officers in Germany had antipathy for the Nazis as a political party, they still carried out the orders, whether you like it or not, that is a political position. To obey the orders of the Nazi regime is to taint yourself, in my view. Clearly not in the view of NATO, because Adolf Heusinger was chair of the military committee, and also various other former members of the Wehrmacht under Nazi Germany got some pretty decent positions out of them. Let's address who this video is probably in opposition to. Leftists or self-declared leftists who insist that NATO is not a thing to be questioned or should be openly supported. Why? Why would you go to bat for this organization? Can you justify and defend these things? And if you can, first of all, you can feel free to try to in the comments, but I can't guarantee a warm reception, but you are welcome to try. Um, secondly, you might want to reconsider what it is you actually believe, or at least try to circle some squares. My experience is that this is often met with denial or just whataboutism, and I made the point that this is not a comparative analysis. I don't want to hear about what happens in China or Russia, or what Gaddafi was doing, because as centrists love to say, inaction has consequences, but action certainly does too, and action has been pretty disastrous when NATO stuck its oar in justify these things on their own terms and do it honestly or else we have to draw our own conclusions and the conclusion you draw from this is that nato sure seems to love aligning itself with nazis fascists autocrats and that its dominant country the one that the alliance is really centered on sure does love its autocratic and anti-democratic excesses both at home and abroad i mean we've all seen that list of US-backed coups and interventions online at least once, right? We need to ask ourselves with this information, what is the alliance actually for? Because I think we'd be hard pressed to just take them at their word from their, you know, statement of values. What is NATO actually for? Well, we can get some ideas by just looking at a particular number, which is that America spends a lot of money on its military. Like you'd think they could spend it on like healthcare, but apparently not. How much is a lot? Well, according to the numbers, over 13 times the next highest spending NATO ally, which is the UK. If you want a comparison to a non-NATO country, it's about three times what China spends, which has a population about four times larger. So yeah, it's pretty intense. NATO does request that its member states spend 2% of GDP on their military expenditure, which some might cynically suggest is a way to ensure there are customers for military contractors. But the official reasoning is so that each member state is pulling their weight for collective defense. Now, America doesn't need a mutual defense pact with Iceland in order to go and do destructive wars or coups or anything like that. That's me being slightly flippant about what NATO is and who the allies are, but it does establish some sense of how dominant the US is. And if the US is dominant, it stands to reason that its interests would be the ones that are the most considered and impactful. A lot is made of American bases in foreign countries, and while NATO deployments are multi-nation a lot of the time, you do have to question what the real purpose of these bases are in, Na in the NATO context. Like, the US has a military base in Okinawa, and it is shameless in its intent as a jumping off point to project power into Asia. And there are regular protests against the US presence there, and they are just summarily ignored. In the NATO context, these bases and access to certain bases have relevance. One of the great examples of this is the Injuric base in Turkey's involvement in US troop movements and general support in Iraq. Now, could the US have laid waste to Iraq without the Turkish air base? Absolutely. I have no doubt of their capacity to do that. But does it make it easier than it needed to be? Also, yes. This isn't to make a blanket argument that any and all NATO action is motivated by American imperialism. A lot of countries in the alliance engage in their own actions, and those actions do sometimes run counter to immediate American interests. 
And that is kind of the trade-off you make when you're the world police and you have everyone's back. Like, sometimes you have to give the boys a little treat. I understand. It's important to note that NATO didn't engage in any overt military operations in the Cold War. Which is probably for the best, again, because I am not irradiated carbon vapor, but does NATO embolden its members to act in certain ways, knowing that they'll be backed up by their allies against any blowback? That was the question I thought about when I was sifting through all of this. I think that you only need to look at the posture and actions that countries have engaged in under the banner of NATO. For example, take Libya. A common defense of NATO in the instance of Libya is that it was primarily a British and French-led action, that Na and that NATO only provided logistical support because they couldn't necessarily enforce a no-fly zone on their own. If it was the case that France and Britain couldn't have effectively conducted the no-fly zone themselves, and we know the result of their intervention is a booming slavery market in Libya, then how is the alliance providing logistical and diplomatic support and cover for them not responsible for it? How can it not be held accountable? Well, it can't be held accountable because the alliance itself simply refuses to be. Again, just look at its website. Mycrimes.txt doesn't do it justice. It did make me question because I will admit, I was a little impressed by the transparency. Whether it was a principled commitment or stupidity, I kind of enjoyed it. And I guess the question that it brought to mind was what was the point of it? Is it just a flex? I don't know. What I do know is that holding a military alliance accountable and Therefore, if you are like Paul Mason, Spice Marine, uh, trying to reform it, uh, it's basically impossible, especially when representation of anti-NATO views within a lot of member states, just, they're just not represented, it's not allowed. Or if they are, they're not really represented by people who have benign ideas. The impunity does allow posturing, and the thing is that posturing can be dismissed as what we called when I was a kid, chatting shit. But if you do chat shit, you might get banged. Look, for example, to Turkey, who have been extremely involved in Syria's civil war. Once the Syrian army clashed with the Turkish army, Turkey invoked Article 6, which meant that the alliance would provide defensive capabilities to Turkey, which they did in Operation Active Fence. And they really need to come up with better names for these operations. That is a, a, a very superficial critique, but come on. Turkey was enabled in its actions in the Syrian civil war, which involved collaborating with extremist groups by NATO. Whatever you think of Assad, whatever you think of anyone involved in the Syrian civil war, Turkey has been nothing but a disaster in its involvement. And that involvement was given cover by NATO as soon as a bit of blowback hit. I think to understand the blowback argument, let's think of the one time Article 5 was invoked. If you know what it is, then feel free to show off how smart you are in the comments. But first, a little background. The Soviet Union wasn't immune from a foolish foreign intervention itself. And in order to prop up a communist regime in Afghanistan, they intervened in the country. Now, you might say that entering the graveyard of empires is a bad idea and no good can ever come of it. But also, the opposing side were a cheerful group known as the Mujahideen. What is America to do? Well, America, as well as several allies and enemies of America, supported the brave Mujahideen fighters of Afghanistan. And they were an interesting group of people, to say the least. The sequence of events that followed, it led to the eventual uh, Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. And no, I don't mean the recent one, the earlier one in the 90s. Something interesting happens when you funnel materials to guerrilla resistances opposing your ideological enemy. Weapons sometimes end up in the hands of people you don't like or eventually need to fight. A number of allegations exist that the CIA provided material support and had ties to a group called Afghan Arabs. You might never have heard of the group, but I can assure you you've heard of one of their alumni, Osama bin Laden. I know what you're thinking, isn't this just Bush did 9-11 with extra steps? And yeah, kinda, but it's important to note that a core stated motivation of the 9-11 attacks was American interference in the Muslim world. Is it somewhat ironic that the ideological beneficiaries of that interference would then turn on America? Yes. Some might even say it's incredibly funny and falls into a pattern of CIA American foreign policy incompetence that included trying to kill Fidel Castro with an exploding cigar and making a fake porno where Sakana was going to be made to look bald. The point isn't really about the specifics or, you know, the specifics of how or conspiracy theories, but that 9-11 happened that one of the motivations was American imperialism, as it was called by the people who did it, 
and that America then invoked Article 5 compelling allies to provide assistance to it. There's an interpretation of Article 5 that gives you a bit of leeway and means you don't have to send troops to defend your ally, but also the post-9-11 atmosphere and the war on terror really did just create a lot of public press and political support for actions and posturing that seemed to be suspiciously concentrated in countries with natural resources that had hostile governments to America. Of all of this, I think I want to address the question of accountability. One of my speculated reasons that this will provoke a negative reaction in some isn't because what I've said is factually inaccurate or that I haven't tried my best to explain what I think the motivations are for the side of the argument that I don't agree with. I think it'll be because even among the left, we know in our hearts that NATO can't really be held accountable, at least not directly as an organization and indirect paths are in the UK and certainly in America, pretty much slammed close. I want to point out again that this isn't and wasn't a comparative analysis. Not liking one thing does not mean you support or like another. If you come at me in the comments like that, I am going to respond with the cry laughing emoji. You've been warned. But also, if your instinct is to yell at me, I just have to ask you a question. Why? What do you want me to do? Not talk about it? If that's what your solution is, then I think you've missed the point of what you claim to believe. Largely, I know there are fascist supporters of NATO, and if you're one of them, please leave, lest you be plagued by my terrifying pronouns. To the leftists out there who feel some need to defend NATO, I do understand why you'd do it. But like Owen Jones telling people to vote Labour or leftists who put on kid cl kids' gloves when criticising the British monarchy, you're just supporting your own continued marginalisation and something that can never really work in your interest. You are the enemy of this organisation, whether you live within its borders or outside of them, and whether you like that or not. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'll catch you in the next video. But first, I do need to thank my proofreader for this which is Rosenkreutz they are a very good youtuber you should go watch their videos they're all fantastic even on topics that I don't even have a particular like deep interest in I always go out of my way to watch them and also I want to thank Emir my graphics guy does great work the thumbnail it was great come on we all enjoyed it and also I want to thank my patrons particularly the top tier patrons Drone Riff, Makujo, Kazi Shida, John N if you would like at least one video a month early if you would like to tell me what to do and what topics to make videos about the the patreon is the best way to do it and also you get access to that discord i mentioned way back in the pre-intro that is if the pre-intro makes it into the video I'm, I, I don't know might might have to re-record it tomorrow I, uh, god it's warm in this room okay everyone with that out of the way I'm just gonna I'm just gonna leave you now. Take care, like and subscribe on the way out, and I will catch you on the next one. Peace.